Welcome to Winning the Game of Life. Known as Jungle Man at the poker table, Dan Cates has gone from being the bag boy at McDonald's with no friends and a dead-end future to winning over $11 million in online poker, over $7 million in live tournaments, and is a World Series of Poker champion. He has found fame, fortune, been to incredible places all over the globe, and connected with some amazing people. It looks like Dan has won the game of life, but that is not the way he sees it. Dan sees winning as doing his part to help everyone in the world win. He knows he can't do it alone though. He knows it's going to take a collective effort with anyone that wants to see the same thing. Join us each week as Dan starts the conversation to do just that. On the show, Dan will interview incredible individuals that have made the impossible possible. Those that have won the game of life and those that want to help others win as well. Hit subscribe and follow Dan's journey on Instagram at the Dan Cates. Let's explore anyone and anything that can help make this world a better place, increasing the odds of us all winning the game of life. And now, here's your host, Dan Cates. What's up, everyone? Today we've got the world's leading experts, maybe the leading expert on mindset optimization for top performers in all sorts of fields in for business executives, for actors, for poker players, for uh, athletes, uh, you name it. Elliot Rowe, how's it feel? It's, it's a big moment. Uh, thanks, Dan, for having me on the show. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, I'm really curious, actually. Uh, how uh, did you manage to, well, how did you even get started in this path? Because it seems like you're able to help people from all sorts of areas of life and i've heard uh i've heard some pretty uh, good things like uh what are you doing really works i'm 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 very curious even how to do it but yeah where do you how did you start um so i started off i i had a fear of flying um <laughs> from childhood and uh wouldn't fly long haul flights uh would fly short haul but was terrified when i got on short haul flights i'd be worried for about a week two weeks before the flight um, someone recommended a hypnotherapist and she managed to resolve it in an hour and it completely blew my mind. So we go into this session and it's like guided meditation. And then it starts bringing up memories from my past around flying. And I had some memories about being in bad turbulence. Um, but then a memory came up about being at my grandfather's house, being shown a picture of a small plane and being told it had crashed and killed one of his business partners when I was a very small child. And um, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the memory. And when I spoke to my parents, they said it was a real thing. And she had sort of, th this hypnotherapist had managed to reframe that memory for me. And it'd gone from me learning that flying was really dangerous to accepting that it was just a freak accident. And I wasn't scared of flying anymore. Because of that, I went and got trained as a hypnotherapist. This is about, I think 2009, I started the training for that. Um, qualified as a hypnotherapist and started working really with just like social level golfers was the people I was helping initially. Right, and then okay. I got really good results. People were saying it was helping their putting a ton. And one of my friends worked in the poker industry. And she said, if you're helping people with the stress of putting, why don't you try helping poker players for final tables? So started working with poker players. They had really good results. Um, started working with some UFC fighters, things went really well, started working with some business people. And then everything from there literally just went word of mouth. So I went from, yeah, basically curing my fear of flying to now working with people running multinational companies. It's kind of a crazy uh, way that things can evolve. It does appear that the path that lots of people to where they need to go is really always non I want to say non-linear, uh, but just really unpredictable, these things. Who would have thought? <laughs> not me. <laughs> like, not me at all. It's, it's like, it's what funny. a blessing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worked out really well. I mean, I was doing, like, I was working renewable energy investment beforehand. Like, complete, couldn't be further away from this. Um, but I found this so much more fun. And I think when you find something that you truly love and you truly enjoy, and you do it, I would do it for free. If I was, you know, won the lottery, I'd still be doing my job because I find it really enjoyable. And I think it's if you find something that's truly enjoyable for you, 
then just things come together. And for me, they came together. And now my whole business is effectively word of mouth. Um, that's the whole way everything was built. I mean, it's also impressive to have it word of mouth. You're not doing any advertising at all. Uh, well, I mean, I have a podcast, um, but I actually, I was talking to my business partner about it this year, sorry, this week. And this year, um, I haven't had a single client who wasn't a word of mouth referral this year. So we've had lots of, lots of leads. Um, but the only people who end up working with me are people who've been referred by a friend who's already worked with me. Um, so it, it seems to be a hundred this year, certainly a hundred percent word of mouth. Oh, that's pretty wild. Huh? Well, um, how did you, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how did you go from teaching social level golf, uh, players to high stakes or people at high like high competency areas uh i would think that that's very different um i mean i can see the similarity but i would think that hmm, oh, maybe it, it's not that it, different it, it was a multi-year process so i didn't uh, start working with high stakes poker players um i started doing free sessions with people from the internet just hey i'm a hypnotherapist i think this might help poker would you like to give it a try Mm -hmm. And I was living in Las Vegas at the time, um, started helping lower stakes poker players. So, you know, one, two, two, five players, that sort of thing. Um, and then from there started getting results and they'd recommend their backers to me. So I'd have someone who was playing mid stakes MTTs and they'd say, Hey, this guy's really helped my game. I think you should work with him. And then I started to work with people at higher stakes. And then from there, as they got the results, they would talk to their friends and then probably about five years into it, um, I ended up working with Brian Rast on the Super High Roller Bowl that he won. Hmm. And that was sort of the first major, major tournament, sort of multi-million dollar tournament. Um, then I worked with a number of other well-known professional poker players and then Ed all went on his really big streak whilst working with me and sort of mentioned a lot that he felt that I'd helped him be in the right mindset to have that streak in poker. And yeah. from there, it sort of, that opened me up to the entire high stakes community. Um, so can anyone learn to be a high performer or a high performer? Or is it just, uh, are there just certain people that are better? Uh, what's the word? I mean, for surely there's surely there's going to be some kind of talent or whatever, but um. Yeah, our, yeah, can anyone do it? Can you remove anyone's blocks? It depends if it's blocks or talents. So I can't make someone who's not talented, talented. But if someone's got self-sabotage, we, we can be very effective at removing a self-sabotage that's holding someone back or issues with professionalism and things like that. But it doesn't create talent. All it does is allow the talent to show itself and stops the person holding themselves back. But usually when I'm meeting people now, they're already somewhere like, I don't know, top 50 in the world at whatever they're doing. Okay. And so they're past the stage of it being that, you know, they're struggling with really just strategy or um, they haven't got the capacity for it. They've all got capacity to do much better, but they know there's somewhere they're holding themselves back. So they're saying, hey, I'm getting anxiety when I'm playing on final tables or in business, they'll say, hey, when it comes to investor meetings, I really struggle. I'm sabotaging in the investor meetings and I, I can't get the the, 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 huh. the lending, things like that. That's similar to poker. I can see some similarities. Mm. All right, well, I don't know a whole lot about hypnotherapy, but my first, my my and probably a lot of uh, the audience's first uh, are got like, uh, <laughs> yeah, one of these things <laughs> yeah. of a pendulum and you put someone in some kind of trance and then it's it's funny that you would uh how would it's interesting that you would get someone to remember something that they don't remember which is weird in itself um I had an experience like that but it had nothing to do with a hypnotherapist or kind of something but anyway uh and i'm also thinking ed can you i've got a couple uh, issues, but not necessarily poker blocks, I think. Uh, but like, for example, I, uh, there's junk food. There's like this, <laughs> I, I would like to be hypnotized to no longer crave junk food at all. So I'd have like, uh, 
We just always be 100% disciplined or hypnotized to be disciplined and wake up at, um, you know, sleep exactly seven hours a night or something like that and that kind of thing and always do yoga in the morning. Like it would be cool to be hypnotized to do all that stuff if it was possible. Well, so, well you, can, you can remove the resistances. So yeah. you can, so let's say if you have a trigger that says every time I feel sad, I go and eat ice cream. Yeah. We can look at where that trigger came from. Mm -hmm. So effect, so I'll explain the hypnosis because at first, you know, the, the swinging watch thing. So we've all seen stage shows or you've seen on TV, a hypnotherapist, a hypnotist, click their fingers and people collapse or they dance crazy dances on stage or whatever it might be. Now that, that's stage hypnotherapy. That's not the work that I do at all. So that's completely different from hypnotherapy as a modality to help people. The work that I do is much more like guided meditation. So if you think about the state that you reach, if you're in a yoga class looking to meditate, it's a very similar state that we're looking for you to reach. But with meditation, you're looking to clear your mind. So you get yourself very relaxed. You might go through a body scan process, a breathing process. That part's very similar. But with meditation, you clear your mind. And as a thought comes in, you're looking to release that thought and go back to your breath. And that's mindfulness meditation. With, with hypnotherapy, we're looking to do that same process. But instead of clearing your mind, we're looking for you to focus in on the emotion that's causing the issue. So if it's anger or anxiety, or in your case, a trigger to eat sweet foods. So what does it feel like, Dan, when you can't not reach for the ice cream? When you're trying to hold yourself back, but you end up eating that junk food. And you'll say, it feels like there's a force pushing me, or I can't help myself, or however you would describe it. We would then say, I want you to connect that back to earlier times in your life. You felt that same way, five, four, three, two, one. What's the next time? And in that more meditative state, these memories start showing themselves in a different way than they would in this conversation, because it's tracing back the emotion to the sensation that you have. And eventually we'll have a memory of you being five years old and your mom saying, I don't know, you're a good boy, Dan. Here, have some ice cream. This is how I show you I love you. Or, you know, some <laughs> random... <laughs> situation that will explain it but we're looking for that in every situation so with anger it might be school bullying and you know a kid has learned that he keeps himself safe by throwing a tantrum and that's just repeating in adult life so it's just patterns that we learn to keep ourselves safe in childhood right. that then repeat themselves over and over again until we look into why we're repeating a childhood pattern oh okay um well, it seems like life in theory would eventually sort this stuff out. Am I, am I right? It would just take much longer than like a clinical practice, right? Because, uh, or am I wrong? I, I don't think it will. I think people tend to just repeat the same mistakes over and over again, unless they yeah. take action. Okay. So, I can see that. It's, it's like tough for someone to build the awareness naturally without someone helping them. I can certainly see that. I would just think that, I would just think that, you know, if it's, if they basically had a, me this sounds like this person had a version of run bad and now they um can't like it's hard to break the habit that's been ingrained to them and this is just their biological conditioning like working their animal conditioning working to uh what it thinks to protect them from this yeah. like this circumstance i mean this makes sense to me right okay yeah why would uh memories just pop up out of the blue like that so, so what it is, is if you're having an irrational response, so we're looking for anywhere where there's a difference between the logic, that what you would tell someone else to do in this situation sure. and your behavior, there's an emotion driving that. So usually it's some kind of anxiety that's driving these issues. Yeah. And your subconscious understands why it's creating the irrational anxiety. Yeah. Okay. So if it's producing the physical sensation, it knows where it's coming from. Okay. And that's and, why when we track it back, it will say, it will show the memory of the reason you should be scared of fire hydrants is because when you were three and a thing opened one up and it knocked you over because you were small or whatever it might be. But there will be a reason why your subconscious is creating that physical sensation that makes no sense. Otherwise, you'd just be doing the logical action. And that's why it can throw up the memories in that way. Okay. Okay. Um, 
one what comes to mind when you mention these sorts of things are these attachment styles like anxious attachment and avoidant attachment because i had personal experience with someone whose behavior would be really really uh out there i thought perhaps they had borderline uh bpd borderline personality disorder um and it sounds like it sounds like hypnosis could be it could help solve those kinds of problems as well borderline personality disorder for those who don't know is uh it's like it, it triggers this intense like mental running situation uh, it, it's quite related to avoid an attachment style um if i understand but it sounds like the same thing where basically the people that uh someone got close with betrayed the people that you know have the now have the avoidant attachment style and that's what's created the avoidant attachment style but from my understanding that sort of stuff is very very hard to uh it's it's possible to remove it but it takes like quite a lot of effort like a year of effort or something like this hmm. um i mean it's certainly the same sort of work i mean i stay away from true mental health issues i work purely on performance uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but there are there are hypnotherapists who who do that kind of work where they're looking to improve true mental health issues um but anything that's created from a previous experience so mm -hmm. borderline personality disorder ptsd especially um yeah. you can revisit those memories and work through and reframe the way they're being viewed by the individual and it does seem to give some relief. It's just, as I say, I, I personally do high performance work and stay out of that realm, yeah. but there are people who do specialize in them. What's funny is... Oh, oh sorry, been... I, I lost the sound, Dan. So, can you hear me? I can now, yeah. It's coming. Okay. You know, what's funny is actually I've been, uh, I've been wondering this myself. It's like, you know, the, the same processes that can remove uh, these... Uh, really negative things can they be used to optimize and I'm just sitting here thinking wait here's here's this guy right in front of me wait what am I like <laughs> maybe I should uh, look more into this how about this are there any um I got a question are there any ways you methods you have of searching for these leaks because potentially people can be unaware of their light leaks right like that happens all the time like it's very hard to be aware of what you're unaware of because you can't, it's like being you can't see what you can't what you see, can't see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I do. So uh, an easy exercise to do with this is if you're in, let's, I mean, probably quite a few poker players watching this, or if they're in business, um, mm -hmm. have a think about who the leading person in your industry is yeah. and write down the list of things you believe they do that makes them the leading person in the industry. Okay. Uh, so that's a very interesting idea. Okay. So then you build a complete list and then you put ticks or crosses next to whether you do those same things or not. Okay, that's so a good here idea. We, here we have a list of what you believe the best person should be doing. Whether or not they are is irrelevant. It's what you believe they should be doing. And you've got the answers as to whether you're doing the things you know you should be doing. Okay. And if you know what you should be doing and you're not doing it, it's a mindset issue, not a technical issue. Because for some reason, you're choosing not to do the things you know that you should be doing. I think, uh, well, I, I want to challenge that um, just because I've had this myself. I want to see what you say. Hmm. Um, I can see how that's true in a lot of situations, but what about this? So what if this person is doing uh, something that uh, there's a situation that I've been running into a lot is that I've, oh, that I've been over complexifying all the things that I do and my, my mind is just like, oh my God, what's going on? Hmm. And it's just like, how do I make this simpler? And I've result i figured out okay i gotta find a way to delegate and create a system to make this simpler and and then you know it's like i keep more and more outlets keep coming in i didn't realize the world was so complicated it's of course more complicated than i thought do you see what the problem is is that you can overstimulate yourself and i'm really curious i can see like the the person that does something amazing will pick the right path but what is the right path anyway like what's your answer to that so, so the first part, of it, it, it's really just about whether you're doing the things you believe are correct in that first exercise. Yeah. So we're looking for, is there a, hey, Dan knows that he should be working out, but he's choosing not to work out. You know, right. it, so that's a very basic, just is there a simple blind spot? Um, when it comes to the complexity issue that you're describing, 
it is much more likely that would be a more in-depth sort of working through why you why are you feeling this way why are you making it this complicated where's this coming from um it's I mean, there's no simple pathway to, hey, this is going to work for everybody. But what we're looking to do is reduce the noise for the individual and have them follow the path that they believe is best for them. And then as we get new information, so if I'm working with someone over a longer period of time, um, we'll see what works and doesn't work. And we, we're then creating a path with the information. But the starting point needs to be that you're doing the things that you believe are correct. Okay. But then once you're doing those, we might find out that they're not correct and we need to course adjust. But the minimum is you're doing the things you believe should be done. And then we work out if that's working for you or not. Um, what about uh, for most people that you deal with? Are there any common roadblocks for poker players? Are there any common roadblocks, um, fears for... Um, you know, high performance people in other fields? Is there any overarching theme? I mean, fear must be a common theme as a general. The, like, the biggest ones are um, self-worth issues, self-sabotage, fear of failure and fear of success. so funny. <laughs> That's definitely the, the largest theme over everything. Really? So people seem to have a, lots of people have a financial cap. So they have an amount of money and it's, for some people it's very low and for some people it's very high but they find themselves bringing themselves back to the same number year after year. So let's say it's, it could be 50,000, it could be 5 million, or it could be 10 million, but they get to a level they're comfortable at. And then if they do better than that, they'll gamble the money away or they'll make poor investments or they'll sabotage what? themselves in some way. That's and so they, weird. If they go below it, they usually find that they can get back to that number quite easily. What? And the, seriously, and it's um, it's like they've set a wealth thermostat for themselves. That's so strange. It's um, it's weirdly normal. Like it comes up all the time, and quite often it's related to how their parents spoke about money, and what they believe a rich person to be. So if they believe that rich people are bad and rich people are people with over a hundred thousand dollars, there's a lot of sabotage of a hundred thousand dollar mark. If it's at five million, it'll be five million. So that's something I've seen time and time again. Oh, that's so self-sabotage and imposter syndrome so people believing they don't believe this they don't deserve the success that they have um so going into a room and feeling that they don't belong there that they're going to be found out in some way and then that leading to self-sabotage and lack of confidence in different situations i could um, see uh, go ahead i was going to say that that's another theme that seems to come up across high performers uh, very Stop. very often so how does that, how does, so it always manifests in terms of bad investments, investments they know are bad. And, uh, so not, I mean, not again, always is it often does, but quite frequently that's when I'll see, um, Hey Elliot. Yeah. I just, I had a really bad blackjack session. If we're talking about the smaller amounts of money, um, where they'll, their bankroll will grow to a certain stage and then they'll jump into a tournament that it doesn't make sense for them to be playing that tournament or they'll start gambling, or they'll make some investments. So I've decided to back three of my friends. And then we see it coming back down again. And then as they get below their comfort zone, they stop doing the bad backing, they stop doing the gambling, and they get themselves back to their comfort zone again. And there are some people who believe they play their best when their back's against the wall, and when they're in a, a tough financial situation. And those people often run this cycle of, they make a lot of money, they sabotage because they're uncomfortable with it and they, and they play worse. Their back gets against the wall and they're stressed about money. They play great poker and they win it all back again. And they go through this cycle through their career of these ups and downs. Are these people, go ahead. Oh, and it's going to say, and, and then we see it at different scales and different levels where it's poker players or people running companies, but I've seen it at all sorts of levels of wealth. All right. Well, I got a couple of questions. My first question is, all right, so let's just say, let's, Take the extreme. It sounds like you should just say, from what I'm hearing, you should just say something like, fuck it. My self-worth is infinity. Is that is that a good idea? I, I'm capable of doing anything. Is that a good idea? I think you'd be more successful if you I think of the two options of my self-worth is zero or my self-worth is infinity. The person who says infinity will do better than zero, but probably optimal is somewhere in between. So what is the optimal? Very confident but realistic enough right. to like look at your failures okay, okay. 
so a growth mindset is optimal where it's okay. not delusion but it's just a, a constant iteration of self-improvement i believe right. is optimal. okay that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah I, uh, I feel like i've like gone a little bit to realize how hard the world and complicated the world is but it's like um still have to like at least assume that infinity is possible or something like that eventually uh maybe maybe not infinity but infinity confidence i mean well it's it's unlimited confidence it's like no limit hold them but you can be playing as deep as you want uh competence yeah that i mean that makes sense um it's just the as i say just making sure that people just don't go along the lines of um i cannot fail oh and well that's over, overconfidence and you know then oh, sabotaging oh. themselves that way oh um, yeah of course that makes sense uh it's what success can do to some people are a lot of these people uh often aware of their problems when they come to you or they wear they wear the of what they are is, is that a common they, thing it varies um, some people will come to me and say, I know something's off, but I'm not sure what. Hmm. And, and then we have a, so the first sessions we do are two hours and we go in a lot of depth in different parts of their lives and patterns that are recurring and we, we have to dig into it. Other people, the, the problem is very obvious. You know, it might be a CEO of a company who says, I really struggle with public speaking. Um, every time I get on stage, I start stuttering and I start sweating and I, I can't communicate to my staff or the investors. Um, that's obviously a really obvious problem for that individual that we'd then be working on. But I would say the majority is somewhere in between where they know there are some issues, but they, we need to dig into it further to work out where we're going to get the most gold for them. Okay. I've got a couple of other ideas. Can you hypnotize someone into liking something that they don't normally like? For example, can I say, Hey, Hey Elliot, I don't really like broccoli and spinach that much and vegetarian food. Can you just like hypnotize me? So I can just, I'll just only I'll, I'll like I'll be like okay man vegetarian food where is it at and please just give me more spinach or uh, you know, whatever. I mean it might be I mean this isn't the sort of work I do so <laughs> we'd have to play with it. Um, I don't think you could make someone love something, but I you could likely change the way they frame it if you can change the framing of the individual to view the food as fuel. And that instead of looking at the taste, they're looking to have the healthiest possible body right. they could have because that's for their best self-interest. Okay. It always has to be in the individual self-interest and it would be reframing yeah. the self-interest to we're looking at the feud as fuel and the broccoli and the spinach we believe is a, a better quality fuel for the body. So we want to be drawn towards that better quality fuel. There might be a way of doing that kind of work. Um, but yeah, it's not something that anyone's ever asked me, but that's the route that I would take would be reframing what food is for that individual if that was what was important for them. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I have had experiences where things in my mind have been reframed, but it hasn't happened through someone talking to me. Uh, generally speaking, it's happened through experience, mm -hmm. um, such as, for example, it would be like, I, I can say a big issue that I've had in my life is that in the beginning of my life, I was an utter failure with uh, women. And I had this, uh, this I, I, I knew I was self-sabotaging, actually. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could, uh, if this thing, I, and then basically over time, I learned to be successful through uh, a lot of trial and failure. A trial and error and and then uh basically some successes and real and seeing it with my own eyes it took like really quite a while to overcome but uh i'm curious let's see there must be other parallels too like i would think one parallel would be someone learns like oh their efforts will always result in failure if they just fail all their you know all their life at uh what they really you know dreamt of they had their dreams like shattered over and over they just never succeeded they wanted to be a star of soccer or star like hockey player they failed over and over and over um i'm curious so uh, hypnosis can actually uh deal with that sort of problem yeah so it can speed up that process of learning 
So, so you would start to reframe those memories. So those trigger memories would come up and you'd be looking at it through adult eyes rather than the eyes of the child who found them particularly traumatic or shocking. And sure. then you look to reframe the memories. So, so memories are malleable that if you go back to a memory of last year now, and then you go back to it next week, it'll be slightly different. So what we're looking to do right. is change and drain the emotions from memories. So if you think about a time when you were rejected from a, by a woman because you asked her out in a way that was offensive or however it might have been, and the way that you felt in that moment, um, it could have been very traumatic. We would go back to those memories and change the way you're framing it to this was a learning experience because I wasn't doing that frequently enough. I didn't know what to say. And this is just the start of a process, just like me learning to ski. I wasn't good at skiing on the first day I skied. Right, okay. So, so you, if you go back to all of those failures, reframe the way they're viewed and remove the painful emotions. Like with approaching women, a lot of guys will say, hey, you know, when I think back to that, it makes me feel sick, right? So we know yeah. there's this physical sensation. There's no reason to feel sick. We know the subconscious is creating a physical sensation linked to the being rejected. So that's yeah. what we're tracing back is that sick feeling. It will bring up those memories that created the sick feeling. And then we're reframing and changing it so that that trigger isn't firing in the same way. So it's not like an on off switch where suddenly you're amazing with women, but what it should mean is the anxiety is greatly reduced, which allows you to get more practice in right, which allows right. you to become better at it. Same with the public speaking. It doesn't make you an amazing public speaker. But if you can remove the stuttering and the shaking, then you're going to be a better public speaker and it's going to be less traumatic to put in more hours of work. And then with practice, you'll get better at it. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, that is interesting. Do you have any uh, dream people to uh, uh, dream? Are there any particular professions you enjoy more doing this with or any? Well, let's just start with the dream person. Uh, are there any dream clients? <laughs> you can right. weirdly seen that it's a choose. really good question no actually um the ones that i like best are people with really high potential with an obvious self-sabotage that's holding them back oh yeah okay so that's the most enjoyable client to work with because you see these massive shifts because they have the talent and it's just this something about this some belief is self-worth issue something stopping them from performing at their best and then we resolve the self-worth issue, whatever it might be. And then we see this shift and, you know, they, they end up becoming extremely successful. That's the most fun for me. Different industries I'm currently finding are quite enjoying traders at the moment. That, that's really good. The emotions are really high. There's a lot of self-sabotage in trading, especially crypto trading with the amount of variance that's involved. Huh. Um, and then businesses... It's, it's a lot of fun when they're sort of a mid-stage business. It's, it's probably more fun with mid-stage businesses rather than large multinationals working with um, founders and CEOs of those. Why is that? Um, there are less, there's a stage where the CEO or the founder, I think they're, they're extraordinarily important to the day-to-day -day running of the business. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you, it, can be, it can be a lot of fun working with them at that stage. Um, where it's sort of the day-to-day -day rather than the figurehead part of the company. I mean, I'm sure if I work with Elon Musk, that would be incredible. But if we're talking about what I enjoy most, it's, it's probably sort of mid-stage up to 100, 200 staff. Um, I think that would be more, probably the, the most fun at the moment. But it changes year on year. I used to love working with fighters. And then I loved working with poker players. I, I enjoy working with these things. But a lot of the time when I've had people so i had a couple of people win the ufc belt i've had people win olympic medals in poker i've had people win virtually all the tournaments in poker now and it sort of feels a bit like you complete the game and then <laughs> you look you look for the next sport or the next business like, uh, the people winning in poker and winning ufc is boring how about yeah, no I want, I want something <laughs> new like it's still fun but it's, <laughs> it's always fun to to try it in another another activity i get to learn about something different i get to meet different people i get to see if i'm right that the same process works in lots of different activities it, so it's more challenging for me if it's something completely new okay one idea i had is so what if you worked with someone who like ran ran for like a presidential election or something like that or like that kind of person who's like because that process seems incredibly unbelievable incredibly stressful 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, like I've ultimate never with a politician. So yeah, that would be yeah, that's a really good one. <laughs> so you give I mean, me one for my list. I feel like politicians are super handicapped by the positions that they put them in themselves in. Also, mm. it's like one of these things that's very uh yeah, it's like uh like I would think it's just like poker on steroids, it's super long term and you need lots of um planning beforehand i think uh that sort of thing but i don't know uh i don't know but that would be really interesting it would be super fun to see what they're struggling with and the self-sabotage you know can be pretty extraordinary <laughs> in politics so so yeah it'd be a fun one um do you have any uh plans in the future or are you just gonna only do this or are you doing other things as well or so um, for me personally, as I say, I enjoy the one-to-one -one coaching. That's what I find most fun. So I'll be doing this hopefully in, you know, forever. Uh, okay. We have an app called Primed Mind that's been out for a few years, and we're completely rebuilding that at the moment. So I'm relaunching that in October, and it's going to be interesting to see how that takes off. And then I've got a number of coaches who I've also trained who work under me. So the idea is over time, um, I will have trained a lot of coaches using the same work that i did sort of a combination between hypnotherapy life coaching performance coaching um so that you know up more and more people can get helped because i can only work with so many people there's only so many hours in the day so right. that's the extent of the business at the moment there, there may be other arms in the future but really it's the app goes from like free to 100 bucks and then we've got coaches and then i'm obviously at the higher end of the coaches but we're just trying to make sure that anyone who wants help at anything from free and above there's going to be someone who can help you or something with the app so it's really just sort of filling in the gaps okay okay uh well it sounds like you're going to be uh a master of uh hypnotists uh <laughs> i feel like this needs a better title like uh like top hip like uh chief hypnotist i don't know i'll think i'll come up with something <laughs> what right. is that as the title it's gotta be like i always mean, I think of goofy ideas like like uh i think i mentioned before like a like the opposite of a super villain but like a, because I, when i think of hypnotists honestly i think of like people being <laughs> hip yeah yeah that's the it doesn't the have a great content i mean it's it's one of the arguments I have. I mean, I could rename what I do. Um, yeah, I use lots of techniques. I use stuff from NLP. I use from hypnosis. The, the truth is I come from hypnotherapy because of my story of my fear of flying being cured. So I, I just stick, you know, I don't talk a ton about the other modalities and I advertise myself this way, but I think it does probably damage the business um, saying I'm a hypnotherapist. And I, I also think it's likely that the reason my whole business is word of mouth is because it's advertised as performance coaching and hypnotherapy because i think it's a reach for people who haven't spoken to to friends who've worked with me and i think that's why it's 100 percent referral over the last few years okay okay uh well is there anything else that you're uh thinking to talk about what are the um plans in the and upcoming well i know what your long-term plans are do you have any plans in the near future um, near plans. Um, I'm doing my podcast more. I had you on recently. That one will be um, coming on soon. Um, so I'm going to do more of my podcasts. I've cut back. I'd cut back on that for a while, and I'm going to be doing that again. Um, and then um, working on a poker book at some stage. I'll get that finished. Been working on it a long time, and that will be out at some stage, and that'll be fun. I, I want to release a mindset book in poker. I think it will be fun to sort of share my ideas and how they're different and share some of the stories from over the mm -hmm. years. Um, and they're the main things. And then, you know, it's summer in Utah and I could do a lot of hiking and it's fun. So that's, that's really the main stuff. And uh, where can people uh, learn more about you and uh, contact you on your, I know on your Instagram. Uh... Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's um, elliotrow.com is the website. Um, Primed Mind is the app that you can download for free and try it and see what you think. Um, and then at Elliot Rowe on Instagram, I think at Elliot Rowe one on Twitter. Um, but yeah, you'll find me if you type my name in. All right, cool. Well, thank you for being on the show, Elliot. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you for listening to this episode of Winning the Game of Life. 
Tune in next week for another great episode. Of course, hit subscribe and follow Dan on Instagram at the Dan Cates.